Hello, everyone. Again, I'm Tom Coffey, the new president of the Louisville Forum. Welcome to our March, to, March 2024 program. The Louisville Forum programs typically meet at noon on second Wednesday of each month here at Vincenzo's Restaurant downtown, and everyone is welcome. Founded in 1984, 40 years ago this year, the Louisville Forum is a nonpartisan public issues group. We host debates and discussions of contemporary and sometimes controversial public policy issues that affect the greater Louisville community. For more information on the Louisville Forum, our events, or to join or make a reservation, please visit louisvilleforum.org. Today's program is policy making related to DEI and ESG. A, CS, a CNN story ran Monday that reported since 2023, 81 anti-diversity, equity, and inclusion bills that target programs at colleges have been introduced in 28 states and in Congress. And this was a tally that they, they compiled, from the, uh, uh, compiled by the Chronicle of Higher Education. Eight have been signed into law. There are at least two such bills in the Kentucky legislature this session. ESG, uh, the Environmental, Social, and Governance, uh, it's an acronym that I actually was unfamiliar with, uh, before today's program. According to a Thomson Reuters story published yesterday, 165 pieces of legislation proposing the restriction of the use of ESG considerations in investments were issued in 2023 in 37 states. So consistent with the Louisville Forum mission, a topic that is both contemporary and controversial, luckily we have two dynamic speakers here today to talk about this and other issues uh, uh, on the periphery of DEI and uh, ESG. To my left, Cedric Merlin Powell is the Wyatt Tarrant and Combs Professor of Law and a Distinguished Teaching Professor at the University of Louisville. Professor Powell received his BA with honors in politics from Overland College and his JD from NYU, where he served as managing editor of the NYU Review of Law and Social Change. Professor Powell served as law clerk to the Honorable Julia Cooper Mack of the DC Court of Appeals. He was the partner, Car, Car Patakin. Car Pat. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was not such a fellow uh, <laughs> in the National Office of the American Civil Liberties Union, and he practiced as a litigation associate with Skadden, Arp, Slate, Marr, and Flom in New York. Professor Powell's articles have appeared in the SMU Law Review, Harvard Black Letter Law Journal, Harvard Journal on Racial and Ethnic Justice, Howard Law Journal, University of Miami Law Review, St. Louis University Public Law Review, Washington University Journal of Law and Policy and the Utah Law Review, among others. Professor Powell's new book project is Post-Racial Federalism, Race, Liberty, and the Democratization of Oppression. In 2014, Professor Powell was awarded the Justice William E. McAnulty Jr. Trailblazer Award by the Louisville Bar Association. He's the first law professor to be so honored. Professor Powell was awarded the 2018 University Distinguished Faculty Service Award for Career Exemplary Service. In 2021, he was awarded the University Distinguished Teaching Award. Welcome, Professor Powell. Thank you. See you to my right. Michael Frazier is the Government Affairs Director for Band, Conver Band Conversion Therapy, Kentucky. He was the 2020 recipient of the Hugh M. Hefner National First Amendment Award. The, the University of Kentucky News wrote this up about Michael Frazier. The Powell County native and first generation college student is an advocate for free speech on campus. Frazier helped to change the university's free speech zone policy, created a student coalition on campus and across the Commonwealth, promoted education around the First Amendment in an inclusive way, lobbied the Kentucky General Assembly, testified before two committees and successfully aided in the passing of the strongest free, peace, free speech protection bill in the United States, the Kentucky Campus Free Speech Protection Act. He's the executive director, Kentucky Student Rights Coalition, the former executive director of Outsource, Office LGB, LGBTQ Resources at UK, the former co-chair, UK, UK LGBTQ Task Force, the first student LGBTQ liaison for UK SGA and a member of the EEOC committee at UK appointed by Dr. Ellie Capilato. 
Dr. Eli Capolito. Dr. Eli Capolito. <laughs> Guys, forgive me. <laughs> I should put this phonetically, but yeah. <laughs> I'm off to a great start here. Um, <laughs> After me, I had to give a bit of homage to the University of Kentucky. <laughs> uh, we will start with, uh, uh, welcome uh, Michael Frazier. We will start with P Professor Powell's opening remarks and then hear Michael Fraser's, and then we will open up to the questions that Elizabeth and Ron uh, have collected. Professor. It's a great privilege to be here. Good afternoon. I want to thank Tom Coffey, president of the forum, Keith Larson, uh, Kaylin Walls. Uh, greetings to Shawnee High School and Southern High School, distinguished alumni of Brandeis School of Law, uh, Donovan Gibbs, distinguished uh, alumni of uh, uh, Brandeis School of Law and any other people that I have not mentioned, uh, please know that uh, we include you in the law school family. So thank you very much for having me here. I come from Cleveland, Ohio, where the City Club is 1912. It's 112 years old. And the Louisville Forum is following in that tradition, 40 years old. I consider them both citadels of free speech and a marketplace of ideas. However, it's not lost on me the irony of our discussion here that we're, we're really discussing is efforts to suppress speech and impose a post-racial orthodoxy where dissent is penalized, a war on critical thinkers. Today I want to talk about briefly democracy, erasure, and post-racialism. We're in fraught times, and when we talk about democracy, we should talk about the dialogue that we're having. And there are three propositions that I want to unpack briefly here today. One, be kind to our language. Two, believe in truth. Three, investigate. Now, I didn't make these up. These are propositions that run through democracy in a book by Yale historian Timothy Snyder, 20 Lessons from the, 25th, uh, from the 20th Century on Tyranny. And when he talks about be kind to our language, I want to emphasize this. Because before we can engage in a constructive dialogue, there has to be doctrinal, conceptual, and discursive parameters. Be kind to our language. Avoid pronouncing the phrases everyone else does. Think up your own way of speaking, even if only to convey that thing you think everyone else is saying. Make an effort to separate yourself from the internet. Read books. That's the first proposition of a critical thinker. Because today's marketplace of ideas have shifted. This is the real marketplace of ideas at the Louisville Forum. The exchanges that we have on internet, they multiply truths and untruths, half-truths, misconceptions. And we grasp onto them without thinking for ourselves how to conceptualize these concepts. So the first thing I would say is be kind to our language. Know what we're talking about and talk about it critically. Believe in truth. That resonates today. To abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power, because there is no basis upon which to do so. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle. The biggest wallet pays for most blinding lights. We just did, in a constitutional law class, the Citizens United case. 2010, and it's still resonating today. The fallacy that speech equals money, that corporations are people, that they can flood money in the marketplace of ideas to express their viewpoints without any type of regulatory power. Because when you say regulatory power, the argument comes back that you are regulating speech. My concern about this discussion today is that we're weaponizing free speech with these anti-DEI, anti-ESG measures. A censored and selective marketplace determined by the state based upon pre-approved ideas that can circulate in the marketplace of ideas. It is totally against the Constitution and unconstitutional for the state to categorize which speech flows through the marketplace of ideas. Of course, we know that all speech is not absolute. There is certainly regulatory powers, and there's a hierarchy of speech. Political speech is at the top. 
there's low value speech, maybe commercial speech, and there's speech that we don't protect, obscenity, defamation, fighting words, incitement to imminent lawless action. But when you have the state picking and choosing which messages can circulate based upon this neutral guise of we're trying to make everyone happy, we have problems. The state is telling us what we should think and how to speak about it. Most notably, we see this in the anti-DEI bills, which is really an expansive reading of these students for fair admissions case versus Harvard and the Uni University of North Carolina. What has happened is people have taken that ruling, which is really limited to higher education, and expanded it to all areas of law, corporate diversity, scholarships. So you have something like Senate Bill 6 that talks about divisive concepts. Well, have we asked what that means? Who decides what is a divisive concept? Intellectual diversity. That sounds good. It sounds neutral. It sounds that we want everyone in the marketplace of ideas. But when you have the state pre-approving what that intellectual diversity is, that is a constitutional problem. Or take House, House Bill 9, discriminatory concepts, closing DEI offices, departments, ending DEI training, ending many scholarships, and requiring that institutions report governmentally mandated discrimination reports. Well, we know the real enterprise there is to preclude any discussion of race, gender, sexual orientation, or anyone who's different, those discrete and insular minorities that should be protected in our society. Or Senate Bill 93 will remove any training or efforts focused on DEI from kindergarten to 12th grade, but that is a codification of the fallacy that's running around that Critical race theory is being taught in schools. Professors like me are indoctrinating three-year-olds to hate America, and we shiver to even talk about race. So I'll conclude there with one remark made by um, Amber Duke, executive director of the ACLU, when she's commenting on these anti-DEI measures. And she says this, these provisions are not new or unique to Kentucky. We've seen them filled, filed in dozens of states as part of an anti-black anti-Brown, anti-LGBTQ plus backlash to DEI efforts that blossomed during the racial reckoning of 2020. Dismissing inequities or legislating Kentuckians' ability to discuss our differences does not erase racism or bigotry or any other type of discrimination and will only exacerbate problems our society state and society face across the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Michael, please. Okay. Let me pull this up. Folks, I'd like to start off by not reading my words, but I think the words of what's the most important <laughs> issue here. When it comes to ESG, um, I, I, and before I read this statement, I do think that when it comes to ESG that we're actually going to find a lot of agreement here. Those are private corporations that have the dictation of what they should do in the free market. But when it comes to DEI and what it's a, a, a misnomer that sounds good, we all want diversity, um, equity, equality, and inclusion on campuses. But the issue is that, for example, just as uh, Dr. Powell has said, we don't, Professor Powell has said, we don't want the state to be choosing what free thought is. Nothing ever comes good when the government tells us what diversity is, either. So, I like to read a statement. I like, my, my, I, like most diversity professionals, was responsible for questioning the status quo, shining a light on the blind spots of individuals and groups, and I, do, and I had to do so from the middle of my organization without any formal authority nor support staff. I had to quickly learn to teach and lead a wide range of individuals with different backgrounds, capacities, experiences, and power. To be effective, I had to gain expertise within several subject and functional areas where I had no prior knowledge or experience, such as how to coach faculty on inclusive teaching, on inclusive teaching practices. Though I have always wanted to be in a position that has so much potential for social impact, I often felt overwhelmed and isolated. In spite of meeting my boss's expectations, organizational demands, 
I felt ineffective when comparing the efforts and getting the desired outcomes. I was exhausted. I began to have increasing health issues and challenges, and I began to feel emotionally and mentally fragile. The role that I always wanted to become, the role that I always longed to be as the DEI coordinator, made me feel unwell, diseased, unsupported, and inconsequential. These are the words of Dr. Tolliver, who became KCTC's chief diversity officer and left and put into her dissertation in 2022. What we have when we talked about DEI, we do have those who wish to have a rehash of the conversation of CRT or anti-CRT. We do have those who wish to ban queer thought, to also to get into core subjects. And these things are protected by the Constitution. I think that we're going to find a whole lot of agreement of where we have to protect free thought. But that is also the point. I would argue, and what I am going to argue, is that at least one, what it has been labeled as an anti-DEI bill, particularly HB 9, is exactly that, is to protect free thought, is to ensure that we don't have the government defi define what is diversity and ensure that we have equity and equality on campuses. And we also want to talk about, and something that we don't want to forget, is the student, staff, and faculty experiences when it comes to campuses. Because I have been on tour here in the Commonwealth. I have talked to students across the Commonwealth. In fact, to this date, I have talked to over 473 students from across the state, from MLK scholars to Porter scholars, to LGBTQ students, to students for justice in Palestine, to college Republicans, college Democrats, and I have heard one resounding thing. The DEI offices are not here for them. They're here to tokenize them. They're here to use them in pictures, but not here to support. And I agree with with the professor that we have to be intentional with our words. We have to be kind to our language and we have to be technical with our language. Particularly when it comes to DEI and HB 9 particularly, we're not talking about resource offices. That's exempt in section, section 1, part 2, LK. Resource offices like the Office of LGBTQ, the Motor Cultural Center, the Audrey Lord uh, GWS office as well, and also housing to ensure that we include, we have inclusive excellence on our campuses are all excluded from the bill in all academic courses. So when we talk about DEI, we're actually, and particularly when it comes to HB 9, we're talking about the same tell. We wanna protect free thought, we wanna protect equality, and God knows that there is racism, there is inequality, there's, homophobia, transphobia, there's real hate on our campuses, there's anti-Semitism, there's xenophobia. DEI office, particularly post-2008 post when Kentucky was released from its desegregation plan by OCR. A lot of people don't realize this, Kentucky schools were considered non-desegregated up until 2008. Post that, we have reformatted and reshifted DEI to mean a completely different purpose from what I think that what we would want on campus if there's hate on campus, we need to address it abundantly. That's not what's happening with this DEI office. They are with the resource centers. In fact, our students are calling it, calling our resource officers with the multicultural center, the LGBT center. These are the, the quote, real angels on campus that are actually meeting student support needs. But the actual DEI officers, and what I would argue, have been here to actually suppress free thought, suppress student speech, particularly when it comes to marginalized voices when they encounter issues on campus of racial discrimination, homophobia, transphobia, and bigotry. And when it comes to statements like Dr. Tulliver's in her dissertation that I have before me, that they have actually been used for PR staples to actually silence these voices and say, there's no problem here. Surprise, government doesn't want to shine a light on problems. And the universities are government. So I would argue and agree that we have to protect free thought. We have to protect diversity, equity, inclusion on campuses. But again, not the scholarships, not the resource centers, but the actual DEI offices have been used to tokenize, exploited, and exploited the people in these offices for more of a PR firm instead of actually creating inclusive excellence and student success on these campuses. 
Thank you. Thank you. And Elizabeth and Ron, please, you have questions. I think it's on. <laughs> uh, and this question is for both of our panelists. What uh, impacts are you seeing from the entrenched tribalism uh, of social media on these conversations? Either one of you can. Professor, if you want to start. Uh, let, let me uh, sort of jump on that. I wanted to talk about an investigating as well. So this is another thing from Timothy Snyder's book. Figure things out for yourself, spend more time with long articles, subsidize investigative journalism by subscribing to print media, realize that some of what is on the internet is there to harm you. Learn about sites that investigate propaganda campaigns, some of which come from abroad. Take responsibility for what you communicate with others. And so I think that answers your question, really. I think you, you talk about tribalism, I think we have these sound chambers where everyone's talking to light and, and there's no engagement. This is the more difficult type of engagement because the person is right across from you or in this room. And people gain courage on the on internet or even through emails. They would say things that they would never say in person. And so I think that people aren't thinking critically. They need to think more mm -hmm. critically. They need to read the paper more. And I know these sound like really simplistic things, but what is happening, I think, in the dialogue and, and what really illustrates your question is that people grab onto phrases and they become truths because people repeat them over and over again without any critical analysis. So something can be halfway true or really true or uh, really false, but there is no distinction. There is no differentiation because people are making their points. And making those points means I'm going to show you up, I'm going to show I'm smarter than you, I'm going to show my position is better than you. Uh, and so it goes around and around in circles. I, I, um, I have to echo that, um, particularly when it comes to politics. Um, you, you know, I have the interesting dynamic and identity, and I don't mind to share this. Um, I am a gay Republican, um, Republic, uh, sm uh, big government, anti-free speech, and uh, using the cohorts of powers of government has never been too kind to my community. Um, my uh, cousin, Jeffrey Watson, was the individual who actually, as a 22-year-old nursing student in Powell County, Kentucky, was one of 43 people rounded up in what was then called in 1985 sodomite roundups and actually challenged Kentucky state law to overturn our statute that would ban homosexuality. Uh, so we, uh, we've seen firsthand uh, how big government does that. But when it comes to intersecting identities, I've had the experience to be able to have a foot in both camps. And what I have seen is what is particularly called ideological ownership. I'm seeing that be worse. For example, LGBT goes here, but you don't talk to them. Um, Pro-life individual goes here, you don't talk to the other side. So the increasing of ideological ownership, particularly on issue-based and issue-based advocates as well, is something that I have seen, especially with um, the more use of social media and digital ads, and, and particularly our elections, and the way that elections are ran on both sides of the equation, because the issue is not to really get voters out, it's actually to get the most voters out in the least amount on each side. Uh, that's, what ha that's what our elections have been reduced to, unfortunately. So with the increase of these issues, I'm seeing more and more divides. And for instance, when it comes to conversion therapy, which is an issue that I, I deeply believe that we need to ensure that we don't, we don't protect those who wish to exploit parents to torture gay lesbians and, and queer kids to make them something that violates their sincerely held beliefs. How many times have we heard that? That's a common issue that we can come forward. But we're having these conversations less and less. And so when it comes to social media, particularly, it's just been a catalyst on that, where exactly as you said, sir, it's having conversations like this is becoming fewer and more rare when we have to, and especially on our college campuses. Our college campuses really isn't the issue of 
intensity in conversation and polarization. It's more of defeatism, um, emotionally, emotional fatigue when it comes to politics. So I have to say one consequence that I see, particularly with the next generation when it comes to engaging these concessions, is not an issue of people getting more heated or divided in the next generation, especially with my 110 student organization members, which is, believe me, our conversations can get robust. I'm worried about emotional and political fatigue with the next generation. And that, that creates complacency when we need the next generation to be our next judges, our next lawyers, our next political officials. And that's something I deeply worry about. Thank you. Uh, to both speakers, what, if any, actual <clears throat> harm comes from providing support to employees and students through DEI initiatives? Mm -hmm. Sure. So again, we have to be persnickety with our terms. DEI initiatives, particularly when it comes to HB9 and SB6, SB6 I do have issues with. When we, um, especially as Professor said, uh, Professor Powell said that uh, the requirement of 50% diversity to participate in quote unquote 50% diversity, um, a lot of people forget that the General Assembly, what is in definition doesn't mean it has the colloquial term. What is in term doesn't mean it has the colloquial definition. The General Assembly gets to define that, um, including within discriminatory concepts, divisive concepts. This is part of how law is created. So they get to name what that looks like. When it comes to SB6 in the, in the current draft language, having 50%, the concern is, are we really going to have the LGBT center and those employees really talk about uh, why marriage equality shouldn't exist? And most DEI faculty and staff are part-time faculty. Are we going to require them to teach something that violates the academic freedom? No. I, I, so I disagree with that provision in the bill uh, very sincerely and very strongly. But HB 9, when it comes to getting persnickety about the definitions, again, endowments are exempted. Academic courses are exempted so long as free inquiry exists. Free inquiry to ensure in essentially the conversation that we're having this satisfies free inquiry, which all classrooms do. Um, academic courses and content is exempt. Um, so we're talking about the offices. Now, when it gets to the resource centers that actually do the student support services, banning the resource centers would do irreparable harm to the students of Kentucky campuses. If we ban the offices of LGBT, if we ban the multicultural centers, it would be irreparable harm to the student support. But what would not be irreparable harm is actually banning the office, and with the asterisk, if I can put that. Uh, for example, the University of Kentucky spends $10.5 million on salaries alone of DEI employees. This does not include the salaries of the Veterans Resource Centers. This does not include the salaries of the Office of LGBT <coughs> or their staff or directors. These are exact DEI officers while the institution's endowments that give scholarships, particularly to marginalized students, only amount to $382,000. The salary director for veteran services is $48,000, while the DEI Office of Institutional Diversity makes $375,000. Um, that is seven resource officers that we could have on campuses. The MLK scholarships at the University of Louisville has not increased in over three years, and in fact, one of their DEI officers makes two times the salary. So that's the irreparable harm. Now the package, I do want to say that these, that these offices have been used. Additionally, these offices have been used particularly after the murder and the tragic death of Trayvon Martin. We saw institutions create these offices not to support marginalized students. Not when uh, black students at the University of Kentucky were urinated on from the fourth floor of Willie T. Young Library for saying, we shall say their names and we shall not shut up about racial discrimination. The answer was DEI, because we have to make those complaints go somewhere. We don't want to make the institution liable. In fact, in the comments from the institutions that I have heard so far, is not to, not concerns about how to create um, cultural and diverse equality, diverse campuses or concern. It's been more about how to save their own butts and to ensure that we don't increase institutional liability. That's not my concern. We should have institutional accountability when racial discrimination and homophobia and queerphobia happens on campuses. 
So that's also a harm, that we're allowing campuses to use these offices and tokenize and cover it up. But there is an, a harm in the package wrapping, anti-DEI. It's not been the greatest term or cycle to be queer in Kentucky right now. Is that a fair statement? The package itself, there's no doubt about it, the term of calling this anti-DEI can be harmful because it's seen as another blow. But when it comes to HB, HB 9, and while, yes, bills like SB 6 is taken from the state of Tennessee and written by, most likely written by America First, the Goldwater Institute, and the Manhattan Institute, um, the harms of those bills not knowing Kentucky and particularly having a bill written based upon student experience of Kentucky, like HB 9, um, that also has a harm too. Thank you. I don't know if I have much to add to that except this. I think that uh, everything that was just said by Mr. Fraser really illustrates that there's a chilling effect in terms of diversity. Uh, these, the Supreme Court decisions, the legislative action, uh, have all made uh, DEI sort of uh, something that should not be discussed on campus. I've seen campuses across the country removing the word diversity, so thinking that that will, so there's a compliance issue, and I think everyone is paralyzed. And in the first place, uh, diversity hasn't really been totally embraced. Let's be honest about that. If we could go all the way back to 1978, the Baki decision where Justice Powell says diversity is a compelling interest, it took 25 years before the U.S. Supreme Court had a majority of justices who would say that diversity is a compelling interest, and then we just overturned it uh, this past summer in Students for Fair Admissions. Uh, that case is, is devastating because it pretends that racism and structural inequality does not exist. And we haven't even been talking about structural inequality. Notice everything we've been talking about has been uh, individual antidotes, discussions about tokenism, discussions about how individual students feel on campus uh, without taking a look at structural inequality. And what I mean by that is the present day effects of past discrimination. I mean, there is a reason why there are so few African American attorneys across the country. And when we fight about affirmative action, really we're fighting about peanuts because we're talking about uh, an elite few of people of color, uh, LGBTQ, uh, Native American, indigenous people who get into these schools, and then we talk about uh, tokenism. There is feelings of isolation. There is feelings of stigmatization. But that's not something that people bring upon themselves. That is the way uh, that the system works. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion is if we want to make sure that people are taken care of, we, we uh, break open uh, the barriers to inclusion. One way to do that to do that is to f talk freely about racism, and not have the state pick and choose and sanitize what we talk about. Uh, you may get your feelings hurt. It may be an awkward conversation, uh, but that is the classic battle that we have for multi-racial uh, diversity. And we've been fighting this battle since the end of the Civil War. This is the third time we're having this debate. We're packaging them up in, in nicer and neater things, diversity, uh, inclusion, uh, post-racial constitutionalism, open marketplace of ideas, but we're still fighting for uh, a reconstruction, a multiracial democracy. And then there are others on the other side who are advancing the redemption narrative that, oh, we've gotten past racism. If we look at race, we're going to balkanize and have divisive uh, topics. If we just ignore it, like Justice Thomas suggests in this decision, students for fair admissions, uh, then everything will go away. And I know you don't have time to do this, but I will tell you this. If, if you want to sort of encapsulate and summarize this debate we're having, uh, read the opinion in students for fair admissions versus Harvard and the University of North Carolina. I know it's 200 pages, but if you want to read some, read Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, read Justice Thomas's opinion, and then read Justice Jackson's opinion. Justice Jackson's dissent is a masterpiece. It is the first time 
in our constitutional history that we have a justice who talks freely about structural inequality and the present day effects of past discrimination. And it's a retort to Justice Thomas, who wants to ignore everything. That's my concern about anti-DEI and anti-ESG legislation. It attempts to neutralize and make us all feel comfortable. Justice Thomas's opinion, it's a concurrence. It is absolutely extraordinary in its lack of intellectual legitimacy. It is, it is breathtaking that a person of color would think this way. And he will respond, well, I'm African American, I can think what I want to. Professor Powell is just a thought police, maybe. But if you read his opinion, he's very selective about what he uses. He talks about originalism and textualism, but that is only on his own terms. And we don't want to go back to 1789. I certainly don't want to. I couldn't speak at the Louisville Forum if it was 1789. It wasn't a good time for all of the people that we're talking about here. So originalism and historical analysis of the Constitution is fine, but it must be faithful to our democratic principles. One thing that is absolutely breathtaking about his opinion is that he says that the 14th Amendment codifies the Declaration of Independence. Now think about that. There is nothing in the Declaration of Independence that talks about oppressed people. We weren't even talking about people of color. And then when we get the Constitution, we actually codify some aspects of slavery. And then that leads to Missouri Compromise. And then we have this epic struggle, civil war. And now we're still having the same debate. And that should tell us something about how we approach race, racism, and structural inequality in this mm -hmm. country. May I respond? Yeah, oh, certainly. Absolutely. I, I, I appreciate that. And, and in fact, I, I would agree. Um, so many people forget, and, and, and something that when I clerked for uh, former Chief Judge Karen Caldwell, this was something that was installed into us. And, and particularly um, uh, Judge Ernesto Scorsoni as well, um, who was one of the foremost civil rights advocates here in Kentucky when it came to LGBT, is that people forget that, you know, unless you were a white 21-year-old male property owner, the Constitution did not apply to you. Uh, we relied upon the state constitutions. In fact, the First Amendment, I always, I always kind of get a chuckle when we talk about the original intent of the First Amendment. Well, the intent of the First Amendment didn't really apply to the individual until 1925 and get low in New York, thanks to the 14th Amendment. And we are, we, we're still having the packagings of the past rewrapped to the new for the, the present. And I think that's so important to realize, but I would, I would quibble with the, uh, uh, with, with, with the um, position that we're not talking about the structural effects of discrimination. We are. We're, we're, in, we're indeed talking about it on campus. We're talking about the student experience, how it's been silenced, impeded upon, particularly the experience of marginalized students because of those structural institutions. Uh, my whole entire argument is that the DEI offices, again, not the resource centers, not the, not the angels that are actually doing the work to support students, I'm arguing that the DEI offices are actually upholding those structures of discrimination to insulate the institutions from accountability, to suppress the thoughts and also, also the free speech voices of when racial discrimination and inequality happens on campus to uphold those structures. Because in the words of uh, one of my favorite writers, Michel Foucault, education particularly can be used as a cyclatory system, a dialectic, if you will, um, to actually uphold systems internally systems uphold systems. We have to break down those barriers. And yeah, you do have to have those intentionality. I, my position is that the DEI offices created by, well, frankly, mostly white straight administrators are there to uphold the fragility and, these, and to suppress these conversations that we need to have on campus. We need to have these conversations. Um, they're not happening on campus. And in fact, when students want to do it, other than to get pictures and put it on brochures and to say everything's fine, these DI offices are not facilitating their campuses. And thank God for the resource centers who are actually trying to do that. There were actually uh, multiple audience, uh, this is a kind of a quick follow-up, uh, questions for Mr. Frazier, if he would be able to cite or provide the sources 
uh, it quoted when giving the data on how much a DEI officer makes at University of Louisville or Kentucky and the monetary amounts of the scholarships that was discussed previously? Absolutely. The University of Kentucky and University of Louisville, I submitted an open records request, met with uh, President Elon Capaluto and uh, Kim Schatzel as well, all their lobbyists. Uh, these are the informations provided. Now, in their list, in the 103 DEI employees that the University of Kentucky particularly gave me, they tried to include the resource centers. Um, it, it, that we don't, that's not the interest particularly of HB9. Um, so I do want to say that the number and again the salaries and, and point comes directly from those institutions given personally to me. And I'm happy and in fact I think I've made it publicly available on Twitter. And this, this question is for both panelists. What benefits do diversity of thought and diversity of life experience have on cultures and innovation and how do these concepts fit within the definition of DEI as you see it? Yeah, I don't know about that. Could you, what, what are they, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting the, the question. Well, I can only reread it. Sometimes they're like sort of connected to a point that's trying to be made. So I'm, I'm trying to divorce it from the point that they're trying to make rhetorically and understand what the question is. Um, best I can do is reread it as what benefits okay. do diversity of thought and diversity of life experience have on cultures and innovation? And how do these concepts fit within the definition of DEI as you see it? Okay, I'll, I'll start off with this and then I'll just transition to that. So, uh, Mr. Fraser made some, some points and I think the, the criticism of DEI, I think is formalistic, uh, very overblown and I don't, I think it reiterates some of the things that are in popular culture. That's why we're talking about the money. Oh, he makes $350,000 and he just sits in a diversity office not doing anything. That's not even the topic that we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about uh, substantive inclusion. And I think it's a really broad and literal claim to say that all DEI offices are, are covering for the power structure so that uh, people will be, uh, will, will seem like they're trying to embrace free speech and diversity, but they're not really. I, I think the DEI offices are, are underfunded. I think that uh, institutional power and political will is not behind them. Uh, and we just use that as a screen to say, oh, oh, that's diversity and, and, and that's fine. Uh, our, our response across the board, institutionally, wherever we're talking about, should be more robust. Uh, intellectual diversity and innovation and, and contributions like that, all of that is fine. Uh, but that really also illustrates the problem that we have. We're trying to define uh, diversity as difference, and so we keep neutralizing it and saying, well, it's, it's everything. And, and, and maybe it is, uh, but we need a firm understanding upon uh, what substantive equality is. And oftentimes when we have questions like that, there's a disconnect. Uh, between what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish. So I'm not really just talking about uh, diversity. I think we're, we should be talking about restructuring uh, all institutions, uh, all avenues of society so that we actually include people. And then we won't have to label what they're talking about. You'll, you'll get the experience. You'll understand that someone coming from a different culture has a, a different understanding. And really, if you look at the Supreme Court decision, again, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, in the last part of his decision, after saying diversity isn't a compelling interest, after not even specifically mentioning Bakke, Grutter, or Fisher 1 and 2, but, but overruling them, that's another discussion we could have in terms of the court's legitimacy. But what is really striking about his opinion is that the very last line says, well, of course, everyone agrees that we can, can still uh, consider race. Mm -hmm. But you have to consider race in connection with other things, like overcoming life experiences uh, and experience with discrimination that you had, uh, strong will, work, uh, just uh, sort of the Booker T. Washington rationale of pulling yourself up by the bootstrap. And you can mention race as something incidental to your experience. Now, notice what that does. It tells you how to speak about race, it diminishes your personal experience, mm -hmm. and it makes you play at race in a way that's susceptible to uh, Chief Justice Roberts. And, and that's another 
veneer on this problem. Particularly to your last point, I, that's that's actually a really interesting take, and I, I appreciate that. Um, so when we're talking about a former overhaul and looking at institutional accountability and talking about the substantive supporting substantive diversity measures on campus, that's the whole entire point of HB nine. So when we look at when we look at the bill and when we look at the issues here, um, we are trying to take off the veneers of campuses. We we are we are trying to ensure that diversity and those that who are wishing desperately to see equality, for goodness sakes, we're, we're having students. Uh, one president of uh, of a student government said. I wish my administration just cared and said that I like black students. That is an important cultural climate that we have to acknowledge. And by the way, these cultural climates, this isn't just speculation. This is required by the Council for Post-Secondary Education in their DEI plans required for performance-based funding. So this isn't speculation. This is measured every year on campus. And guess what we're seeing? And after Bakke, particularly the compelling state interest, which is what we have to have, particularly when it comes to affirmative action. Again, Kentucky post-secondary education institutions were not desegregated until 2008. The order wasn't lifted until Steve Brashear in 2009. If there was a compelling state interest, it is here in the Commonwealth. We have required campus climate surveys. So these are part of the product. It's not speculation. Students are speaking. And they're saying that these, after 10 years, particularly when the first DEI plan posts are released from the Office of Civil Rights by the U.S. Department of Education from meeting the very low criteria of, of concerning to be finally uh, 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 desegregated, our DEI plans went, we still have problems here. So these are qualifiable, and I do, I do suggest and when we talk about diversity as well on campus, and we have to go to the substantive diversity, because we're not just talking about black students, we're also talking about Asian students. By the way, Asian students are not including Kentucky's underrepresented minority definition. They're not counted on campus, because Asians in Kentucky colleges are considered to be overpopulated because they meet above the criteria of the population based upon statewide numbers. Uh, so for instance, statewide population numbers of Asians is 4% of the state. I would consider that to be unrepresented, but campuses do have usually an average of 6%. Um, Kentucky's URM definition, which is in KRS 164020, section 19, does say that the Council for Post-Secondary Education does get to define. So again, we talk about, we don't want the state to define what free speech is, but by God, we don't want the state to define diversity either because they're excluded people. Um, I would consider that these numbers and defining diversity gets to the question here. That is a important, that has a, a point of impact that absolutely does have a chilling effect. Uh, when we talk about low income students, again, we're not talking about one level of diversity. DEI impacts first generation, Robinson scholars, Appalachian students, disabled students, those with impairments, gay students, queer students, low income students, and the intersectionality of these identities. Kentucky's URM numbers have underrepresented minority students, which includes black students, non-Hispanic, Latino students, Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander students, has risen over the past 10 years by 0.6%. When you take account of out-of-state students, particularly poaching in southern Ohio and Columbus neighborhoods, and just to give you an example, and I know that we're going to talk about scholarships soon, uh, we have to, because we're appealing to out-of-state students, uh, particularly within these neighborhoods, we have to also compete with out-of-state tuition. So those kids are getting uh, $10,000 average scholarships. And by the way, this is per CPE, uh, the Council of Post-Secondary Education Institute, uh, Council of Post-Secondary Education, which is Kentucky's Higher Education Authority. Uh, we're given an average of 10,000 students versus $3,000, $4,000 in scholarships to kids in the West End. That's not right. So that's also a chilling impact, but let's also talk about the numbers. Let's talk about the stats. When we look at, although Kentucky's URM numbers are going up by 0.6%, when you take out out-of-state students, and particularly low-income students, 
URM numbers are actually, URM numbers have actually went down by 20%. Kentucky's low income students, we have lost a total of 49% of low income students in the Commonwealth in the last 10 years. We have lost 17.9% of Kentucky's adult learner. In fact, in SB 191, we are finally adding adult non-traditional students to the definition of underrepresented students on campus. These are horrible impacts, but let's talk about the impact of DEI as well. We have free thought. Uh, when we talk about DEI, and particularly when it talks to structural, to try to systematic institute, systematic structures on campus to silence, particularly free thought, especially free thought when marginalized students speaks. We have the creation that became a higher ed trend called the bias incident response teams, where instead of directing students to go to the Title IX office, which is not a DEI office, or the Title VII office, which ensures uh, non-discrimination in employment, um, or Title III when it comes to um, um, uh, financial assistance, they say go to these offices to create a whole entire system to actually silence and suppress students. And the Sixth Circuit, particularly in the University of Michigan versus Strassel, have actually ruled these. Sixth Circuit, that includes Kentucky, Ohio, Michigan, and Tennessee, has said that these offices under the institutional diversity offices, particularly at the University of Kentucky, or similar, should I say, to the University of Kentucky, because again, U of M, University of Michigan case, actually suppressed free speech. When I, in 2022, when passing the Kentucky Campus Due Process Bill, the largest due process, substantive due process protection bill in the United States, we are the only state that actually gives due process housing rights in the United States. We found out that institutions were disproportionately punishing black students on campus and kicking them out because of institutional processes. These are part of it. And these are student experiences that we see. So I do quibble, the student experiences are reflective of the institutional systemic issues that we see on campus. And that's what, and I would argue that HB9 particularly, again, I have issues with SB6. Um, HB9 particularly tries to ensure that we take off the veneers on campus and hit these issues straight on. Professor, do you want to? No, okay. I think we, uh, time for one more. Thank you, Elizabeth. Assuming for the sake of the question that DEI programs are here to stay but are going to go through some form of modification, uh, Mr. Frazier, are there any changes that could be made that, wherein you would be okay with a DEI program? And Pro Professor Powell, are there any changes that could be made to them to satisfy the other side that you would be okay with? I, I, I took long, I feel like I took too much time last night. Oh, Professor no, no. Powell, please. Uh, yeah. I don't, I, I think I would say this. I think we need to start thinking differently about uh, diversity. Uh, a lot of times when we get involved in these debates, we just think about terms, uh, diversity. What does that mean? It means difference, but that really wasn't defined in Justice Powell's decision in Baki. He just used an example. Maybe you could get a tuba player from Utah and that would add to the marketplace of ideas. There's an important First Amendment component to uh, affirmative action jurisprudence of the court as well, that you're bringing in all of these things to help uh, educate classes. And Grutter was sort of based upon that, that notion that you'd get a good uh, mix in the classroom, there'd be cross-racial understanding. Uh, but scholars have critiqued that as well because uh, people of color aren't really getting that uh, benefit. They're really helping to educate the predominantly white institutions that they uh, go to to get an education. So I would say this, we need to rethink how we think uh, about race, racism, and structural inequality in the United States. One way to do that is to conceptualize substantive inclusion. What does that mean? That means breaking down barriers. That means stop worrying about what we call a particular office, but put things in place institutionally that actually promise uh, meaningful benefits on the other end. So you, you just don't look at uh, these percentages. You can look at impact. One way to do that, and I think this, I've been thinking about this, is to use the US Supreme Court's jurisprudence against it. 
you know, you have segregated schools and the court will say, well, that's not intentional. That's not anything that we did. Those are voluntary choices. And unless you can prove discriminatory intent by the school system itself, there's a case called Washington versus Davis and Milliken versus Bradley that says that then there's nothing you can do. You mentioned that the consent decree was waived in, in 2008. That was disastrous because in the parents involved decision, Chief Justice Roberts says uh, discrimination doesn't exist. It says it's de jure, and you've uh, lifted the consent decree, or de facto, and yes, that's societal discrimination, but unless you can prove it, it goes away. So one thing you could do in terms of diversity is look at first-generation students, look at food deserts, look at uh, segregated school systems, look at identifying people who want to be the first lawyer in their family, the first engineer in their family, and you don't have to call that anything. You can just go out and reach those communities that have been impacted by years, decades of uh, discrimination. So it comes about actualizing the present day effects of past discrimination and targeting specific areas where that's graphically true, like food deserts, segregated schools, poor housing. People who inhabit those, uh, those uh, entities in our society aren't necessarily people of color. It could be white people or poor people. But one thing that our discussion illustrates is that we can't segment the analysis. We can't say, well, uh, this is a neutral thing. We're just talking about economics, or we're just talking about LGBTQ, or we're just talking about black people or brown people. There's an intersectionality that has to be present in our analysis. We look at race and. Uh, the structural impact upon the discrete and insular minorities that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So maybe look at areas where people have been excluded and try to include them. If, um, ditto. Um, so, exactly right. Um, if men were angels, there would be no need for government. No, since men are, are not angels, government is a necessary perversion. We're not perfect. We're in the pursuit of trying to get things right. There is discrimination. There is awful things that happen. And it's our ability to speak truth to power and take it heads on, not to cloak it, whitewash it, sterilize it. We have to, ha we have to address it heads on. We, can't ins ins we cannot insulate it, particularly fragility of certain identities from not feeling comfortable when the people that are impacted the most by these campuses, students, faculty, and staff, are saying we need help and we need support. So the first thing, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, there, to directly answer the question, yes, there is a form of DEI. I think that, or at least we can better support, um, and, and I'll start from the last point uh, that Professor Powell mentioned, is that there is intersectionality, and in fact, we have the greatest form of intersectionality already in the term that disproportionately impacts marginalized individuals, including African Americans, Eastern Kentuckians, um, and in fact, it was noted in the March 2023 report, the tipping point, financial affordability, uh, where CPE, the Council of Post-Secondary Education, and I'm happy to cite this, page five, bottom section, points one, sorry, points three, four, and five, where Kentucky's scholarships doesn't go to the most in need because they have lower retention rates. The ROI, poor kids don't have good ROIs because it takes more money. Poverty, place, race, but poverty. Poverty is the better indicator when it comes to actually helping students because poverty disproportionately impacts marginalized students. We have homelessness on student, we have homelessness on campuses I went to every campus to actually find homeless students, learned about the services and the systems because poor people have poor ways, up on my mom would say, and finding those ways to do those support services. And that does come disproportionately, I hate to say, including in Tent City next to the University of Louisville. There are 20 homeless students that live there because they can't afford, because education is to have their ability to have a chance of 40%, having a degree decreases your chance of 40% of living in poverty for the rest of your life. Wouldn't you live in your car to escape it? Or find a way? Poverty is the answer. So the first thing I would do is change performance-based funding. 
I would make it more intersectional by changing the URM definition and include those subcategories to reflect that intersectionality. So that's the first thing I would do. I would also take off the council, I would take off from the council for post-secondary education, the board of presidents, because frankly, I would replace it with pre from presidents to students and staff and faculty. Um, I'm sorry, I don't believe we should tokenize the one student body president the, that has a traditionally a being of an identity and say that they're reflective of 290,000 students across the Commonwealth and that's only four year public and KCTC, that's the number. So the second thing I would do is also, I, I would take the money from DEI offices and put it into student support services. This includes ensuring that we don't have a, we don't have a, a $370,000 DEI officer. We have seven support resource officers. I would also increase scholarships, which except WKU, there, is, there are no scholarships in the Commonwealth of Kentucky that are race exclusive. MLK, Porter Scholarship, MLK at the University of Kentucky, Office of LGBT, they are not race exclusive because we I have already adjusted higher education, particularly our scholarships, and definitely at the University of Kentucky from doing race-based decisions. But again, the impact of students for fair admission versus Harvard and also North Carolina as well, we've already seen that impact. And that's also reflected in, in uh, particularly the using the essays as a way to keep that as a bit of a form to ensure that we listen to the experience of the marginalized. That's reflected in HB9. So, but I would take the money from these offices because God knows that we need more scholarships here in the Commonwealth. I would also find better ways to ensure that those good people, and this is something that's so missing in this conversation. There is no, the DEI officers are not bad actors. These are individuals who want to change campuses and make social impact. Unfortunately, these offices aren't, they, they aren't supporting that purpose. I would find offices, including Dr. Tolliver, whose dissertation, I'd put her in Title IX, EEOC, to actually make real cam campus and cultural impact. We need to support these resource centers and what actually fosters student success. So that's also something else I would do uh, when it comes to actually supporting. It seems that when we really want to support diversity, equity, and inclusion, the answer is not the DEI offices per se. It's using these resource officers, resource uh, resource centers, and scholarships. All right, thank you, Cedric Powell and Michael Fraser. Thanks, everyone, and be sure to uh, uh, get back, come back here on April 10th. Uh, keep an eye out for our next forum. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>